Ladies and gentlemen, on tonight's episode of The Spiel Canal, we discuss secondary objectives, how to evaluate the good, how to dismiss the bad, and how to build towards the glorious. Please welcome our special guests. When will they, will they be famous? I can't answer that. But here they are, the 40k aficionados, the Western Warriors, Matt and Luke. Hello there. The Spiel Canal, yet another gaming channel with no budget for animation or even a catchy tune. We'll just chat about secondaries, and I ask some questions. We'll start with like lowest common denominator. So, um, what are secondaries? So, oh right, right. what yeah. are secondaries? Oh, is it started? Yeah, I started ages ago. Well, three minutes ago. You heard me doing the silly voice. Oh yeah, oh, okay. I'll use that. Hat. <laughs> um, yeah. So what? What are secondaries? For those that are, you know, they hear these terms a lot, and a lot of people like I've had people contact me about other things like with Necromunda and say there's always like this assumed level of knowledge about what certain terms mean and people will just understand it. So people will talk about secondaries. Are we doing in terms of GT pack? Because it's very different from match play to GT pack. Yeah, let's just go with latest. Yeah. So secondaries, they when, you, when you're starting a game, pretty much any game with you and your opponent, you first up select which army you're playing, do your battle size, and then you go into the mission, you have your objectives on the board, you have your mission objectives, and then you have to pick three secondaries to um, choose what you're going to be completing for Battle Royale. They're similar to Battle Tactics from AOS, but instead of being a different one every single time, you pick three right at the start, and then you run with them throughout the entire game and you keep track of the score as you go. All of them have slightly different objectives to complete. Generally, they will tell you whether or not you complete the objective at the beginning of uh, the end of your turn or the end of the battle round. Yeah, it's a way of keeping score. Uh, you can get a maximum of 15 points per secondary that you get. Uh, capping out at 45 across all three secondaries for a game. Is that always the That's same? That's always the same, yeah. All, all secondary objectives are always capped at 15 points. So you could earn five in one turn, one in the next, but no matter what you get it up to, it's always up to 15. Some of the secondaries have maxes. Max yes, calls. yes, very good point. Go on. Reading the fine print of some of the secondaries, some of them will say cap to a maximum of 12 points. I think there's quite a few. There's an example. That. Called, R&D, that? Yeah, retrieve na- Nachman data. Uh, Nephilim data. At, Nephilim data, yeah, <laughs> now. Uh, that caps at... Um, Retrieve left and data is one where you do an action in a quarter six inches away from any other edge and you complete the first one, you don't get any points for that, but then your second one you score four points, third quarter you score eight points, fourth quarter you score 12 points max. So that's capped out at 12. So they make the ones that are a little bit easier and a little bit less interactive for your opponent uh, score generally lower, like the Synapse one that you've got for your Tyranids. Yeah, Cranial Feasting. That one's yeah. Cranial Feasting. It might not be that one, it's one of the it's ones. It's one of the ones, that's useful. Isn't it? They're not very good at turn at once. So are those ones where you can do the whole um, like objective and scrum within your turn so there's no opportunity for your opponent yes. to interrupt with it? Yeah, that's generally that's generally how they do it. Obviously it's different on different basis. Basis is 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 mm. because the uh, the sisters ones are just very easy to score and they're not interactive, but they're not capped. So those are, that's why the sisters are so good. They're easy to score if you build your army for them. Yes, that's one of the big things. That's one of the big things. If you want to be better at a game, is that what you need to do? You need to build your army towards your secondaries? Absolutely. Yeah, generally before you do anything, like a lot of people go online to look at the best armies, a lot of people go online to see what units are the best, or they go in the codex and they see the data sheets that are really strong, they're like, whoa, that's amazing, I need that in my army. But yeah, having strong units in your army helps you kill your opponent or survive your opponent's damage but you could get people going online looking for the best possible list and then scoring 10 for it because they don't know how to play the the army for the mission. So it's all deciding. So before I do anything, before I start any any list building or anything like that, I will open the Nephilim book or whichever one is the most recent one and I will look at all of the secondaries that are available to all, all of the factions, like all the gener- generic secondaries of which it's like. Um, and that I'll look at the faction specific secondaries because every single faction has their own set of between three and four faction secondaries that they can pick in place of the generic ones. So for example, retrieve Nachman data, going back to that one, it's a good example I think because it's quite a multifaceted objective. So you have to go into the four different quarters, six inches away from any um, dividing quarter line, which means that you have to get quite far into the opponent's territory for 
generally two of the quarters on normal deployment map. And they added in the Nephilim book from, oh yeah, I said Nachman, didn't I? But yeah, from the Nachman book, they added another thing in for Nephilim, where you, if you have less than six models in the squad, you have to roll, roll a dice and roll less than a number of, um, equal to or less than the number of models in the squad doing it. And if you roll higher than that, you fail the secondary. So when I'm talking about building an army around that, for example, let's go with Space Marines, everyone has Space Marines. Generally, uh, Assault Marines are a very baseline good unit to do that because you need to be infantry. So you could, for example, put a six-man Assault Squad unit with jump packs in uh, reserve in the, in the sky, and then you can bring them down in Deep Strike in the quarters when there's space for you to, and you can do the action with them. So they're cheap, so you're not really wasting too many points on just sitting around doing nothing, because when you do an action, you can't do anything for the rest of the, the turn. And it's going off without having to risk rolling, because if you only took a squad of five, there's a chance that when you bring them down, you could roll that six and fail that secondary. And the deep strike obviously allows you to get into those more difficult positions. So that's why a very good generalist unit for completing that is the assault squad. Obviously, they're not massively, because when you look at their data sheet, it's not massively strong. Like at the moment, it got a recent buff with yeah. free war gear. They're quite popular now, but like previously, I'd still have taken them if I had that as my plan for my secondary because they complete it and they do the job. If they complete that and die, they have 100% completed their task. Like it doesn't matter if they literally do no damage at all throughout the entire game, they have completed it and most of the time they would have got you four points. And that's well worth it for a trade. And it's a perfect example of army building because you need to have those six man squads and you don't want to be suddenly in a position where you're choosing R&D as a secondary if you haven't built your army for it because you're potentially using expensive deep striking units then, units that you hadn't planned to be doing in action and nothing else. Like for example, if, if for Blood Angels, I'm an avid Blood Angels player, so when you, if you took Sanguinary Guard, if you look at a six-man squad of Sanguinary Guard and a six-man squad of Assault Marines, a six-man squad of Assault Marines is 108 points, a six-man squad of Sanguinary Guard are 180 points. Sanguinary Guard are very good at damaging, they've got good armor save, and Assault Marines are okay at damaging, but they're quick. So if you bring down them, both of them in a quarter, and they both get the same amount of points, then the Assault Squad is going to be much more efficient at gaining those points than the Sanguinary Guard are, because you're saving so many points on it. And the Assault, assault Squad not doing anything is, it's, you know, water under the bridge, but a Sanguinary Guard squad doing an action and not being able to do anything for the rest of the turn is just... A disaster for your battle plan but uh yeah going back to the nackman thing so generally as a minimum if i'm taking if yeah. i'm in that god damn it if <laughs> yeah going back to nephilim <laughs> retrieve nephilim data as luke called r d if you're taking that secondary or you're planning to take that secondary as one of your three every single time which you generally can do because it's a generally non-interactive secondary for your opponent so no matter what they've got you can take that secondary but obviously you have to plan around it so generally no matter what game you're going to be on you're always going to be in one of the quarters even if it's the quarter deployments where you have to deploy wholly within one of the quarters you're always going to be in one of the quarters so you can rely on that getting that one reliably with a troop squad because even a five-man troop squad if you're a troop with objective secured you get plus one to your roll so even a five-man troop squad would get nephilim data without having a chance of failing it so you're always generally going to have one in your deployment zone so you can save that one for a little bit later in the game because it's not a non-at risk action to do and then I'd probably take, if you want to be super safe, let's go to the Assault Squad example, I would take three Assault Squads with jump pack six mans, and then I've got one unit to do each of them. But generally, you're not going to need to do it in every single quarter. There's only two missions out of the nine that are in the quarters, so you could probably have two troop squads. So generally, at a minimum, if I'm baking in the idea to do Nephilim every single game, I would have at least two troop squads and at least two six-man assault squads to get those hard-to-reach areas that you can't quite get to. And I put those in deep strike generally just to offer your opponent, number one, the having to hold a unit back to screen you out, which means there's one unit that they're not using, and number two, because if they don't screen it out, you've got three points and there's nothing they can do about it. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a comprehensive on the example of Nephilim, and obviously that's one that... It's a, it's a very good example, but it involves actions, it involves building your units to a different from the baseline and understanding what kind of units you need to bring to be able to complete that secondary. Are you actually rolling with that secondary on your Blood Angel? I would never roll. I would, if, if I'm taking Nephilim, yeah. I would never ever bring a squad 
at full strength at least, because obviously you can take damage throughout the game, but I would never take a squad that I expected to complete the Nephilim action that I would have to roll. I would never want to leave. No, I mean like you're running with it, not oh, rolling using with it. it. Not th like you're oh, actually right. rolling. I thought you meant, well, Obsessed. that as well. That's, That's more important. Yeah. So you in your actual list, your Blood Angel yeah. list, like you when you did boot camp the other day, yeah. they have Nephilim. In a, well, yeah. In a 2,000 point game, definitely. 1,000 point game, much more difficult because it's uh, smaller quarters and you have to be six inches away from each edge, which makes it a very small zone where you can actually complete Nephilim. But in a 2,000 point game, yeah, yeah, I would take it. As a general example, the Assault Marines are a good example across Marines, but Blood Angels, you yeah, have better yeah, options. Yeah, definitely, you do have better options. Like for example, I know I mentioned the, the Sanguinary Guard as a unit I wouldn't want to be doing it with. But if I am already pressuring my opponent with a lot of my other jump pack units and pushing them into their deployment zone, which generally quite happens because Blood Angel is quite an oppressive army, um, I will use my Sangre Guard to give me four points if it sets. So I would bring them down in a position where next turn I'll be able to pressure a certain point or defend a certain objective, and I would use them for ne ne Nephilim. It's not necessarily the one that I build my list around because there's a few other secondaries that are quite good for Blood Angels, like for example their unique one's pretty good and easy to build around. But if, for example, I'm not going to be able to get in their deployment zone very easily because of Relentless Assault as one of my secondaries, um, I'm playing against very durable enemies, so I can't rely on my Death Company killing units, so I can't take Fury of the Lost, then that list starts getting smaller and smaller across secondaries I can take. And if I took Nephilim, I wouldn't be upset. I know I'm scoring at least eight on that, which generally you're expecting from Nephilim, because it's quite easy to do your home one and then two other quarters. And then that last one is always the hardest, because it's like the, where they're castle is going to be with all of their units screening out but generally yeah i do i do i always have it in mind with a fast moving army for slower armies it's a little bit harder because obviously you need to get into those quarters and it's a bit more difficult but, but for fast armies it's very very good for tyranids for example it's a good it's a good build into rnd because you can like a squad of gargoyles for example um you can bring in on each uh you can manipulate them so you can't bring them in on deep strike but they've got 12 inch move. Um, you can reserve them as well. And Strategic you can sense. do, um, what's the strategy? Uh, encircle? One you pick the one where you pick them up basically, yeah. which is quite a tactical, quite a good tactical one still. It got heavily nerfed, rightly so, because it was being used to just kill things and then go back up into the air. But that's quite a good one for NIDS players, for example, because they've got quite a lot of units that are fairly cheap that can just you know, do that secondary action. Like ideally, um, the cheaper the unit is and can still get into those dangerous positions, the better. Like, for example, another one for sisters, mm -hmm. Zephyrim, which are the pistol ones? Or is it Seraphim? Seraphim. Seraphim, very, very good. Like a six, six, six woman squad of them, super cheap, what, like about 70 points? Five. So that's even, so against an assault squad, yeah, they may be weaker overall because they've got two wins and they've got three up saves the same. But it doesn't matter how weak they are, as long as they can come in and do that objective for the cheapest possible points, it's very, very good. When you want to do your actions for secondaries, does that count as shooting phase, or does it... Because you can't shoot if you do the action. Does it fit within a phase when you declare you're going to do that action? It will say. So when you do an action, um, most of them will say what phase you need to do it in. I'd say 90% of them, at least, would be at the end of your movement phase. There's obviously the psychic actions that you need to complete in your psychic phase, and they don't stop you from doing everything else, they just stop you from doing any more powers. But all of the normal actions, like raise the banners, uh, retrieve Nephilim data, um, get the good bits for orcs, they all happen at the end of the movement phase. You do need to keep an eye on, with all those action ones, whether they complete at the end of your next command phase, or at the end of your turn. Generally, the ones that complete at the end of your next command phase are a hell of a lot weaker than the ones that you complete at the end of your turn, because Say for example, there's, I can't remember what. Okay, let's say you put the, you're on an objective in the midfield, you have to do an action and it's not completed till the end of your next turn. Um, then your opponent could just shoot you off that objective and then you wouldn't get the points and you've wasted a unit for a turn. Mm. So the ones that complete at the end of your turn are much more desirable. And generally I wouldn't even touch with a barge pole the ones that you don't complete at the end of your turn. Because it allows your opponent to interact too much and influence what points you're getting. So you'd only kind of have those if they're forced upon you from the scenario or something? Yeah, yeah if they're forced upon you or there's literally no other options, which sometimes it comes up. Because even then, you want a really durable unit to make sure you're going to do that. Yeah. You're going to do it. At that point, you've got the problem of spending too many points on a unit. 
yeah, and you've got your, you know, you've got your big warrior blob or you've got your big terminator blob suddenly doing an action and nothing else. It, yeah, it's going to get you the points, hopefully, if you dedicate that much to it, but then it's not actually doing all the other things you need to be doing in the yeah. game. Yeah. So it's all just a, um, like a cost analysis? Yeah, it's a cost analysis. How, it's, you, every time you are building your, your army and picking your secondaries, you're saying, I want this, this unit to do this secondary. Is this cost effective for me to spend? Am I still going to have enough of the rest of my army to be able to contest my opponent for their objectives and hold the primaries if I'm essentially taking these points out of my list to do something else? So are you using the um, like the games that you're doing like just now with Luke and then the game you're going to do in a little while as well? Are you using that to test secondaries or are you already familiar enough with the mechanics where you kind of already know... What, what's going to work and what's not going so to work. So for me, I've played for going on 16 years now. Mm. And I feel like I've got, especially with Ninth, which is a fantastic edition, my best one by a mile, I think. It's just um, designed very, very well in the way that it's all very strategic based. And it's all to do with, like you could kill your entire opponent off the board, but you could still win. They like, still lose because they score better, which has happened many times in Mobile Blood Daniels. Yeah. Um, generally, it happens sometimes, like definitely. Like if I have a new secondary, the first time I play it is always going to be, yeah, let's see how this works. Yeah. Like a good example for that was Fury of the Lost for me, which is uh, Fury of the Lost is a special Blood Angel secondary that you can take, and um, essentially, if you kill a unit with a Death Company unit, you get three points. If you kill two units in the turn with Death Company, you get four points, and if a Death Company unit dies in the battle round, you get a bonus one point. So there's five points a turn max that you can score. But if you kill something every turn with a death company, there's 15 points, which is your max for that secondary. And I wasn't sure if I'd be able to consistently be able to churn out damage with death company, because obviously they can shoot your death company and then you can't be able to do it. But obviously they're very, very quick because they're a 12 inch move unit and they're very, very deadly on the charge. So I wanted to give it a go and I gave it a go and I thought it was fantastic. I, minimum, again, you have to look at that building the list. Because it's death company units, you have to expect at least one unit isn't going to make it into combat because of opponent shooting. So. I take, for my, my death company, I take two squads of ten and a squad of five, equipped with uh, three hammers in each, the rest chainswords, and I take a death company, cat a death company captain, kit out to the nines with special hammer, more attacks, all that kind of stuff. Because then I can look at the list and go, okay, this unit is going to be killing stuff, which I want to do anyway, because that's what they're there for. Death company can't do actions, and they can't fall back because they're too angry. So... Um, <laughs> But their one goal is to kill things, and if I get rewarded for killing things, then it's only doubling down on what I brought them in my list for. So I wasn't sure if it was gonna work, I wasn't sure if I was just gonna go into the units, because they generally have to trade up, because that's one thing that we talk about a lot, is trading units. So you are giving a unit up to gain points, but then losing that unit. So a way you can make that more efficient for yourself is using that unit that's going to be doing scoring, killing something that's worth more than them, either by points or objective scoring, and then you've traded it up. If you trade down, you're killing a weaker unit. If you trade up, you're killing a stronger unit. Generally, Death Company are very good at trading up due to their damage output. So I'm gen generally throwing them in, trying to trade up, and I was worried that I might not kill that unit entirely. And then at that point, I've lost out three points. But there's a lot of redundancy in that by bringing four units. I wasn't 100% sure. Well, I knew it'd be good because I built my list around it, but I wasn't sure if I'd be able to get towards those 12 and 15 points. But after the game, we worked out that that was the case because everything died to the Death Company. <laughs> The, yeah, the first part is how you've built your list around the secondaries overall that you have in your mind. The second part is how you then adapt when you see your opponent's yes. army. Yes, that's a very good point. Because, for example, um, there's been a few scenarios where, well, one example is you want to avoid scenarios where you end up taking like assassination in combination with mental interrogation because then all of a sudden your opponent can go, oh wait a minute, two of your secondaries are relying on interaction with my characters. Hopefully you're taking assassination because they have lots of characters to begin with, but then that, they can have quite a lot of effect on that game then, because they can be very, very um, cagey with their characters, not interact with you, and make it really difficult for you to score your points, put you in a position where you have to almost sacrifice units to get there. Um, and as soon as you're on the back foot like that, it's, you know, the ball's kind of in their area part. Yeah, so, so what you're saying is like the the most you generally you can plan for two secondaries like when you're building your list you can pick from all the generic ones and all of your unique ones you can plan to have these are the two secondaries i'm going to take 99 percent of the games 
Um, like for, for example, my, my Blood Angel list, going back to that, I will take Fury of the Lost every game because I've built my list around that. And I will also take um, uh, Blade of Sanguinius 99% of the games because that's Blade of Sanguinius is one where you pick one of your, after deployment, you pick one of your characters, generally my Death Company Captain, he's an absolute blender and you can pick an opponent's character and I would generally pick one of the weaker ones. So something that's, you know, not got an involved. And, and you can games. pick that. Yeah. So, and if my character kills your character, I get 15 points. If my character is not the one to do the killing, um, I can do it with another unit and still get 10 points. So I've built around that to be able to have a very reliable, at least 20 points from those two secondaries, which is very, very good. Now they've changed how they do the scoring. Um, so that third one is always going to be generally um, dependent on your matchup and your opponent. Like if they've got a lot of characters that are killable, that's a very important thing. People sometimes see four characters and go, oh, assassinate, but then it's four custodian characters and you mm. just can't kill them. Yeah. So as long as you like evaluate whether or not they are, the objective is completable, number one, and number two is whether or not it's good for your army to be able to complete, then it's going to be a good secondary. So that third one is always going to be a bit of a toss-up. Like the one, the kill secondaries are generally what fills up that third category. So you've got um, assassinate for killing characters, no prisoners for just killing infantry units, um, because you get for every ten wounds that you take out, you get a point, and then you get bonus points depending on hitting certain thresholds. Uh, grind them down is generally good for you when your army is very very tough and their army is weaker because it's kill more units in a battle round. Um, so those ones are the kind of ones that are going to fill that. Other so, so with yeah, with that bonus one, so you would have so like grind them down. You wouldn't take that against custodes, or um, was it take no prisoners because they don't have enough. Custodes are a good example of an army that's actually quite difficult to choose secondaries against, yeah. unless you're delving into some of the more solid faction secondaries that don't require interaction with your opponent. One, one of the ones that has got a lot stronger in Nephilim specifically, because they removed like, things like Stranglehold and stuff like that um, from the previous book, uh, Psychic Secondaries have had a massive resurgence yeah. in utility. Number one, you're bringing Psychers, which are strong units anyway, because their ability to add an additional phase of damage to your army um, and throw out Mortal Wings, which are undeniable, apart from a few special rules that armies have. Um, so. The thing with Psychic Secondaries is if you're picking Psychic Secondaries, for example, there's two Psychic Secondaries. There's Warp Ritual, where you have to be within six inches of the middle of the board, and you cast a Psychic Action, which is the same as a Psychic Power, it just means you can't do any more powers that turn with that Psyker. Um, it goes off on a Warp Charge value, and if it goes off, you score points, and you can do it three times, it max out at 12. So that's very, very strong. And there's another one which Luke has mentioned a few times, which is Mental Interrogation, or Psychic Interrogation, Psychic interrogation. What it's called. Yeah. And every time you're within 24 inches of character, it doesn't even have to be in line of sight. If you get that power off, you get three points. And if you get nine or more, you get a bonus CP, So, yeah. which is really amazing in the current, this economy of CP, with when everyone's only capped out at six now to start out with. Yeah, so like for Tyranids, for example, Mental Interrogation is tempting. Lots of people like Warp Ritual, because it's... it's um, only three turns of... It's, like it's only three turns, you're getting four points each turn, and it doesn't rely on interaction with characters. Um, so if you're, think, if you're confident that you can have a f good control over the centre, then it's a good one. The other one is a Bore the Witch, of course, which is kind okay. of like that. So, yeah, going back to um, picking the secondaries, the, 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 the thing with Psychic Power ones is they can be denied by your opponent, which is obviously a huge risk. So if you're picking... The, you want to take them almost 100% of the time when you're picking into an army that has no um, Deny the Witch abilities to be able to cancel out your psychic powers. You always want to be going, so that fills that third slot very, very nicely most of the time, because that means that you've built for that secondary by bringing at least two psychers. Never do it with just one, because if that psychic gets sniped or taken out by some sort of sniper rule, you've lost so many points that are available to your army. So at least two. And say. you're not using their powers. Yeah, you're not using that one psychic's powers. Depending on how cheap that psyker yes. is. So obviously it's similar to the assault squads and stuff, it doesn't matter how cheap the psyker is that does it, as long as they get it off. So the cheaper the unit, the, um, the better trade up on points that you'll get. Um, but with the, if you're picking it into another army that has psychers and abilities to another witch, obviously increasing that risk massively because you're again taking the chances of you um, getting that off every single turn much, much lower. So it's a little bit more risky. Yeah. I suppose with Tyranids, a lot of their units have can at least do one psychic, one psychic power. Yeah. You have all their HQs, plus they've got that 
biological adaptation that can also give something a psychic power. Yeah, they've got, got the Neurothrope's got the ability to do 3d6 cast, choose the highest. Um, you've got plus one to cast and deny on the synaptic imperative as well. And then, so generally, Tyranids are quite heavily reliant on um, psychic secondaries just because their faction secondaries are not that strong, not particularly strong at all. So yeah, they're, they're a really strong pick. You have to be willing to drop those psychic secondaries though if you come up against armies like Grey Knights, for example. Yeah. Because they will just deny you points, uh, even sisters. Oh, because pretty much everyone can deny on a six. Yeah, Plus, if they do the prayer, they can do it on a five. Yeah, you have to be confident that the odds are fairly considerably in your yeah, favor. Yeah. Because it only takes one to nine, you've lost point score. It happened in our game. Yeah, exactly. And I denied so, one, and you lost that in three points. And that's three points that you can't recover as well. That's the other thing you need to allow for, though. You're not going to be able to control dice rolls. So, yes. generally, in that matchup, Nids would run a psychic secondary against orcs with one psyker. I wouldn't think twice just because psychic secondaries are so strong. Maybe in honest. hindsight, warp ritual would maybe be a bit better. Possibly. Just because you only have to do it three turns and it gives you an opportunity to take out some of my psychers. Yeah, but even in that scenario, at the end of turn four, four. you still scored nine. I sc still scored nine. All right, so that so if we look at an example of um, sort of said about with. Sisters and Necron, they've done really well out of Nephilim for secondary. So what does that look like? Let's like say Necrons, what does it look like that they've done really well out of it? What makes something good for the secondaries for them, you know, which is which is kind of pushing them ahead? Because they seem to be doing very well competitively. Yeah. Which I'm guessing is down to the points they're getting from this. Yeah, the, yeah. Big, thing with, the big thing with uh, the armies that are doing well at the moment, because they generally balance the data sheets and the army power levels very, very well recently. Um, touch wood. And uh, the thing that's pushing people ahead, as you said, is their access to their unique secretaries, which are just much, much stronger than what other armies have access to, which allows them to win more games. As simple as that. So, weirdly, Necrons are in a tricky spot because they're really strong right now because of what balances have been brought in in combination with their custom dynasty of being able to be obsec across the whole army. So, that combination with their secondaries where a lot of them stipulate if you are objective secured, it happens by the end of the turn. It doesn't rely on any interactions with your opponent. It's supercharged their secondary scoring ability, basically. Um, the tricky thing for balancing that is, if you then rebalance that, Necrons are a different situation where they don't have the strong data sheets to a points equivalent. Um, we won't talk about the Silent King, because he's an example of where they've he's really holding up a large part of that army as well. So that they're a good example of, you know, reliable secondary scoring because ancient machineries, for example, if you've got a canoptic unit or a core unit doing that objective, it scores at the end of your, by the end of your turn um, because it's objective secured and you get four points for doing it on each objective you go to. Um, so again, it's like a high scoring potential just getting to that objective. Um, again, because of the custom dynasty, because you can have that pregame move You've got your units basically on the objectives already. You could get some of those far-flung objectives that you wouldn't normally get to until later game. You could even try and sneakily get to those and get points on those to begin with as well. So that's why Necrons, you're seeing you know, a lot of talk about their secondary scoring potential. And you've even got units like the Silent King, for example, can complete some of these secondaries um, because he's technically core now. He can complete Ancient Machineries. Um, you can have vehicles completing it as well, I believe, because um, they've made vehicles core. So there's some really weird, interesting interactions with Necron units and their secondaries that make them really strong. They just have lots of potential. Not only are the secondaries uh, strong, but lots of units can score them uh, quite easily. And they're so fast now, Necrons. They used to be this slow trudging across army. They might speed up for a you know, one turn with Relentless March and, and your protocol that, of Sudden, Sudden Storm. Storm. But now you can potentially have that active all, the whole game. Relentless March affects so many units now because there's so much core. So all of these combinations play in nicely to their secondary play. If you want to have like an army that's tactically really, really strong, I know people say, oh, it's easy to score, but with Necrons, you almost have to hold yourself back a little bit and just really focus on, if you've got a Necron player, who knows their secondaries, really focused on scoring, and only kills what they need to kill. I know that sounds silly, but just the bare minimum they need to do just to keep you off them or keep you whittled down enough so you literally don't have the dice to get through a chunky Lich Guard unit or, 
or the Silent King or something like that, they're just really reliable at scoring and not relying on the opponent to do it either. Like they're not even playing into the strong psychic secondaries. And they do have some nice play with the Silent King and denying those psychic secondaries as well with the Denial. Like literally, things. Necrons can come out. If they, on, on one of the maps where there's four objectives going down the middle and they have to deploy in a quarter, they can literally score 19 points turn one, which is obscene. It's absolutely nuts. Like you can get on the four objectives, which is the four no man's land for 12 and then uh, do the Ancient Machineries, and then you can do Treasure of Aeons, get another five for being on three or more objectives in No Man's Land, and then you can uh, score one, two, three, four for Purchase of Vermin, which is bonkers. Absolutely nuts. Yeah. They've got a lot of flexibility, because they've got area denial secondaries, they've got um, sit on an objective, do, do an anyway? action, yeah. Uh, again, lots of units can do that. Treasure of Ounds, you know, you're controlling those units fairly easily with objective secured units. Um, and even Code of Combat, you know, if you're running a Silent King and, um, you know, a Command Barge, um, the, both those units are core now, so they've got Killia, they've got more reliable. That's probably one that you probably f flip in or you bring into your list when you see your opponent's list. If you're thinking, oh yeah, actually, they don't have the greatest ability to get at my noble units, my noble units can pick up a lot of, if they've got lots of MS units, so if they've got lots of small units, I'd probably, I'd really consider taking Code of Combat. Um, but generally, Purge of Vermin, um, your Ancient Machineries, your, you know, Necrons, very often you'll see them taking all three of their faction secondaries. Um, I don't know as much about Sisters. Sisters are very strong in the way that they have one which is to do with their Miracle Dice, which is again, a uh, mechanic that your opponent can't interact with. It was boosted recently as well. It was boosted recently, so you can score a max of 12 on that one, but as long as you spend two Miracle Dice every single turn in your opponent's turn, and then one other turn spend one additional Miracle Dice in your turn, you're scoring 12. And there's nothing they can do about it. And you can just spend it on failed saves if you need to. And there's literally nothing your opponent can do to stop you from scoring 12. And there's other ones where you can pick a, a, um, a, a no man's land objective near your deployment zone, score three points at the end of every turn for holding that, and you've got a lot of obsec and a lot of fast moving units and it can clear off that objective, so you're scoring three, again, at the end of your turn, so very, very strong. They just have a lot of, it's essentially whichever army has the strongest secondaries that don't involve their opponent's interaction too much, they're the better picks most of the time. So which um, factions stand out on the opposite side of that that have come out with really bad secondaries and they have steal cults. <laughs> Gene Steeler cults. And they have to they're having to rely on the uh, the, the, the core ones that, that anyone can take, the generic secondaries, because their own secondaries aren't. Yeah, going to the core ones as well, the core ones everyone has those secondaries, or has access to them. So generally people are building lists with less characters in, so they're not giving up assassinate, not as many vehicles in, so they can't max out with bring it down. So they're building as much as you can build your army for getting secondaries, you can also build your army for denying those secondaries. And if you, pretty much your only options, like for example for GSC, um, that your only option is get, get those generic secondaries, it really leaves you with some slim pickings for actually scoring well, like 10 and up we're talking when I say well, on those points, so it can be much, much harder. So is that what you'd be looking at if you're evaluating a secondary is sort of getting to double digits with scoring it? And so maybe not like getting maximum points on it, like you were saying with true R&D, but you'd be looking at, I'd, I'd be wanting to get three of the four, so I'm getting, you know, just the, 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 the increment below maximum points. Yes. If you're doing it reliably, nine plus, nine, nine or ten, ten yeah. decent. Anything above that is just pure gold. Like. If you can find one where you're scoring 15, which a lot of these very strong factions at the moment do have access to, you are golden. Like if you can score 15 reliably, you're going to win most of your game. But if you see one and it's like, well, if I do this and I do this and I do this, I could probably get eight or nine, but I'm only reliably going to get four. You just take it off the table. If you are going to yeah. score less than six, reliably score less than six, don't even consider it. Generally, mm. I won't consider a secondary where I'm not getting more than eight. That's quite, my minimum. Yeah, quite often no prisoners is a trap. Um, because even considerably, really, you don't want to be running that unless you're facing like a marine heavy army. Yeah, with a lot of marine infantry. With a lot of marine infantry. And even that's hard um, to cut through now with armor of contempt. Yeah. Um, but against those, those, there's a few guard lists popping around with like 120 guardsmen in. You're going to take no prisoners because it's easy points to pick up. But then I guess that's falling into the category of 
you can't build around it because you don't know what your opponent's going to be. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, but uh, it's just it's that picks into that third secondary slot, you know, where you're, you're that's always the hardest one to pick. Whenever I'm playing against, like when we're doing the boot camps and stuff, everyone always picks their first two secondaries. They're like, oh, I don't know what to pick for my third one. It's like that's how they've designed it. They want that to be a difficult choice for your third one because you're going to have to look across the table rather than at your own data sheets and go, what can I pick that's going to score well and my opponent can't deny me. One of the big things, I'm just going to say this immediately, engagement on front sucks now. I see a lot of people taking that one because they see the quarters and stuff like that and they're just like, oh, you know, I can get my units into the quarters. But now it's added that six inch caveat where you need to be away from each of the table quarters and it gives you such a small area to get into and it's only two points if you're in three quarters. Abysmal. I think it's generally one of the worst secondaries in the game right now. It went from a really decent one to a really, really naff one. So. It really forces you to play a certain way. Yeah, and you have to con like commit, like with Retrieve Nightman Data, you're maybe committing 300 points of your army towards completing it. With Engage, you need at least 1,000 points to commit towards that, and that's just not worth it. Playtesting is really important, because take Chaos Space Marines, for example. Really, really strong codex, data sheet wise you know, we don't even need to talk about Abaddon. the Lord himself. But if you look at the secondaries, on paper, the secondaries are very, very average. Um, there's maybe one or two, um, but I've only I haven't played them that much. But playtesting them, you look for those synergies between the secondaries as well. So the long war synergizes really, really well with um, raised banners because the long war is all about taking your opponent off of objectives that you want and controlling them. So I think if you do that in combination, you get three points for it. Um, that might not be. But you get points for taking basically the objective from your opponent. Your opponent's also incentivized not only with the primary to take objectives back um, or take them off of you, um, but if you're running Raise the Banners as well as another secondary as Chaos Space Marines, um, they're coming towards you as well because they want to tear those banners down. So it's kind of two synergies there that work quite nicely. You're raising banners and objectives and trying to take hold of those. It's almost a bit of a backup as well, because if you do lose that objective to an enemy, you, you then incentivize not only to get there to take the banner up again, but then the long wall's giving you objectives for taking that objective. So anything that can incentivize you to play the style of play you want to play, definitely consider those secondaries. Um, One of the things we forgot to mention about secondaries, actually, is that each of the secondaries come under a different category. So you've got your No Mercy, No Respite, Battlefront Supremacy, Shadow Operations, yeah. the Psychic Ones, whatever they're called. Um, and you've got like a different category for each. You can only take a maximum of one per category. You can't take more than that, otherwise that uh, won't be cheating. <laughs> so it's just one of those things you need to keep an eye on, especially with the faction secretaries, because they're in different spots in the Nephilim book. Um, just make sure you're not accidentally doubling up on those uh, categories. Yeah. So do the, do the faction ones come under the categories as well then? They do, yeah. They're all named under yeah. categories. Like for example, um, the Battlefield Supremacy, Blood Angels have Relentless Assault, and there's also the basic one engaging all fronts. So I can take both. We might have talked about it a little bit, but really when you're list building, be wary of how many secondary points you are going to give up to your opponent. So a, a common one is 27 Scarabs in a Necron army. Really horrible to deal with for a lot of armies. But that is a lot of no prisoners points. Um, that's like nearly getting you to a reliable, your opponent to a reliable no prisoner score. People still run that, and it's very viable, especially with your your objective secured, because there's not that many things that can reliably chop through that many wounds, especially if you've got a Chronomancer to boost it up. However, you now have to accept that whatever you're building into your list, you're likely giving up a full 15 for no prisoners building that list. So you need to make sure you're not giving up, you know, a, a large amount of points on another secondary for your opponent. So yeah, be wary of that one list building. That I feel sorry for Astra Militarum players. It's one of the big frustrations that has been for a while, despite all of their buffs, is they're just so easy to score secondaries against because quite often, um, less so now, but like an armoured company of Asher Militarum, you know, bring it down really is probably going to be a no-brainer as one of the secondaries. And that's quite a big thing for some armies, because some armies don't all have really strong secondaries like Sisters or Necrons, and you're giving that opponent sort of like, almost like a sigh of relief by putting that out. Um, certainly for match play. If you, if you want to run, run an armoured company and it is really strong, go for it. Just be mindful with what else you're building. You're not making it really easy for your opponent to just not interact with you that much and just score lots of points. See, that's one thing with the, for example, bring it down, because I play knights as well, 
leaning into secondaries is another thing you can do. So when you're building your list, if you're already going to give up max, bring it down. You might as well, if it's good to have more vehicles, then take more vehicles because they can only take 15 from you. They can't take more than that. Yeah. So with Knights, I lean into that, take as many vehicles as I possibly can because that's the only thing I've got access to anyway. But, um, you know, I'm giving up like 21 points to bring it down there. But I know for a fact that because I've leaned so heavily into playing Knights and having a lot of vehicles, it makes grinding them down easier. So it, as much as you're giving your opponent options, you're also opening up more things for yourself. And then I suppose if you're leaning into, you know, okay, I can give my opponent max on this, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not really giving them many other options for anything else that they could. Yeah, the only two that you really need to be careful on stackling, st stackling, stacking, for example, with guard, a massive horde of infantry and a load of tanks, because then you're giving up both of those. And then it's, at that point, your opponent can just go, oh, sweet, so I just need to kill you and get points and that's it. And they're just like, yeah, so it can cause problems for you. Oh, okay, so then you're kind of, because you were saying at the beginning that um, you know you can you could be tabled, but you've scored enough points that it doesn't matter anyway. That doesn't automatically win you the game. But if you've gone with if you've built your list in a way that's left you very susceptible to secondaries, then you can then they could have the incentive to table them because I'm going to score maximum amount of points just from doing that. that that's it. I can now focus on that. The the movement phase actually is a huge thing with secondary scoring because. It's all tied into blocking your opponent from scoring their secondaries if you can. Generally, if you're the fastest you know, player on the table, you have an advantage in the game if you've built your secondaries for that reason. Um, and you need to make sure that you've built a list that's going to be able to fill, fulfill you know, the secondaries you're planning on doing. And as much as we talk about and think about secondaries, the primary is still so important as well. So. Just think about how your secondary scoring is going to synergize with the primary goal of the game, which is scoring that primary as well. Um, yeah. Generally, most of the time, um, in at least in high-level competitive play, um, the primary scores are generally going to be, you know, you're blocking your opponent from getting primary, they're blocking you from getting primary, you're both getting onto the objective. So you're going to be scoring roughly the same for primary most of the time. Um, primary is the thing that swings most with uh, if you're dominating your opponent, their primary score can go way down but if you're both you know level pegging as most most armies will do and just chug along you're scoring quite similarly for primaries so generates the secondaries that are going to decide the game which is why it's so important that you build your list around the right things you pick the right ones at the table you look at your opponent see what they can deny you and what you can give up and just playing to those points above all else if you see a nice juicy target that's really close by in turn five, that if you kill it, great, you've killed it, it's an awesome character that's really causing problems the entire game, you killed them, scored no points, and you lose by three points because you didn't move on to a quarter to get engaged or something like that, that's gonna feel really bad. So you wanna you wanna always think, uh, one, one thing that I always do at the beginning of every single turn, I have all my secondaries written down on a board or a piece of paper somewhere, at the beginning of every turn, you wanna look at that piece of paper and say, look at the paper, look at the board, look at your secondaries and go, okay, this is what I need to do this turn. At the beginning of every every turn, beginning of the battle, you want to look at the state of the game, look at the secondaries that you've got, and get a game plan for that turn on how you're going to score the most possible points you can. That's generally what you want to do. Cool. Well, don't have any other questions. If there's anything else you want to say, now's the time. You're lovely. What's your channel name? Um, Der Spiel Canal. You're lovely, Der Spiel Canal. Herr Spieler. Herr Spieler Canal. <laughs> Kanawi channel. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Game channel. Thanks. <laughs> there you go, good. Thanks. All right then. Well, you spoke a lot. Sorry. No, it's good. Um, yeah. Um, is there anything else you think people might want to know that people might ask usually ask you about? Why are you so beautiful? It's not really a secondary, is it? That's the primary. <laughs>